So we're here with um, Michael Emerson, who's a uh, associate professor at the Rousset School of Social Sciences from uh, UQ in Queensland, and um, we're just asking a couple of questions about um, ethnomethodology, conversation analysis, and related research. Uh, so, Mike, um, uh, what are the basic uh, re ideas of um, ethnomethodology? Well, at its most basic, ethnomethodology is the study of people's methods, ethnomethods, and it rests on the assumption that social life is immensely complex and that it can be investigated uh, to reveal the ways in which it's accomplished. I mean, perhaps the best way to think of this is in contrast to what conventional sociology uh, mm. thinks is the topic of sociology. Conventional sociology collects data in the form of uh, answers to questions or uh, through surveys and seeks to explain uh, the patterns in the data by appealing to conventional demographic variables. Now that's a gloss, but that would cover mm. most of, of mainstream sociology. Ethnomethodologists, on the other hand, argue that within mainstream sociology, you really get no focus on how social life is done, how it's accomplished. And so their primary uh, in investigation is to treat social life as an artful accomplishment and to examine the complex and detailed ways in which members, people in society, go about the business of producing society. Adding a little layer of complexity to that, what they argue is that the, the methods by which people produce uh, their social settings, their society, are simultaneously ways in which they can tell other people what it is that they're doing. So the doing and telling of social life are, are in some ways uh, intertwined. Let me give you a very simple example of this um, through a, a, a non-verbal um, example. Mm. Um, queuing behavior is, is a very uh, simple mm. but a very convenient way of exploring ethnomethodology's basic ideas. Ethnomethodologists would say that people don't just queue, they do queuing. Mm. That there are methodical ways in which the parties to a queue exhibit that they are members of a queue. And of course this is you know, consequential for interaction because members of a queue might like to demonstrate that they're parties to a queue and that they don't want to lose their place in a mm. queue. And of course other people who might be passing the queue want to be uh, informed that there's a queue here and I'm just going to pass it by. So you get situations such as you know, queues in front of ATMs which may stretch quite a way across a pavement and people who don't want to be parties to that queue, well, they have their own ways of demonstrating that they are not members of that queue. They will you know, forge a little hole through the queue and so on. So that very simple example of, um, you know, of making activities observable and reportable is the, the core uh, assumption of ethnomethodology. Uh, so what are the basic research methods of um, ethnomethodology? How does ethno collect its data? Well, ethnomethodologists would be interested in any form of naturally occurring data. So typically what they would look at would be people in interaction. This could be uh, audio or video recorded data. But it might also include the uh, analysis of documents which people produce in and as a course of their ordinary lives. Ethnomethodologists would reject any kind of data collection in which the, the presence of the, uh, of the researcher or the observer was also there. So that they regard uh, those forms of data, such as experiments or surveys, as, as some ways artificial, that you cannot do investigations of everyday conduct uh, when the data isn't naturally occurring. Again, it could be more complex. I mean, ethnomethodologists have studied uh, interviews, mm. but they study interviews more as an interactional practice. So mm. they wouldn't examine an interview uh, for evidence of um, some other reality. The, the only reality that they would say is, is studyable is the interview itself. So in short, any kind of uh, everyday interaction, be this an ordinary conversation, meeting, uh, you know, activity in a scientific laboratory, or well, 
that literally anything could, mm. could be analysable to reveal the methods by which those settings are produced. Okay. Um, and so what are some of the benefits um, of uh, methodology? Well, the benefits are a little bit more difficult to explain. I mean, a, a, a lot of very interesting ethnomethodological work has been done in what have been termed technologically infused workplaces. Garfinkel himself uh, instituted some of all his studies at the work program, and he got a number of his students, most famously uh, Mike Lynch and Eric Livingstone, who carried out very detailed studies of scientific activities mm. uh, on the assumption that you know trying to find out what science as an organized activity consisted of um, generating from that we can say that ethnomethodology would be particularly useful in any kind of work setting where humans are interacting with machines such as computer supported cooperative work where the typical approach to the organization of those activities has come from with outside. Mm. So you get expert systems, engineers or designers who think they have one way in which people should be fitted to work settings mm. and, and technology, which often do not take into account the detailed ways in which people actually communicate with each other and with and through the technologies. Now, designers and engineers are now realizing that the insights of Vesta methodologists are vital, and a lot of the, the work that's now being done in those settings is informed by ethnomethodologists. So that would be one area in which you can uh, investigate work settings and find out what's going wrong. I mean, there are classic examples of the introduction of work practices where uh, expert systems, outsiders, mm -hmm. have tried to impose some kind of routine on the, on the workplace, which has failed, mm -hmm. because they have failed to take into account uh, the systematic, methodical ways in which people go about their businesses. So you, you design workplaces to fit with people's routines rather than the other way around. Right. That would be one concrete example of it. Yeah. Um, 